This is the Project Management Podcast. We bring project management to beginners and experts. Find us on the web at pm-podcast.com or send your emails to info at pm-podcast.com. Hello and welcome to episode number 177. I am Cornelius Fichtner. This is the Project Management Podcast. Nice to have you with us. Today, we begin with what I hope is going to be a great journey here on the program. We are starting the Project Management Podcast's Project Leadership Series. The idea is that for the rest of 2011, we are going to return again and again to the topic of project leadership by bringing you interviews with experts from the field. We launched a series with four interviews that I did with two authors of project leadership books. The first two interviews are with Rick Valerga, author of The Cure for the Common Project. And then you will meet Thomas Yuli, who wrote Leadership Principles for Project Success. However, the first author that you are going to meet right now is Peter Taylor, because Peter has once again published a new book based on his blog, The Lazy Project Manager, and he is donating the proceeds to a good cause. Let's hear what he has to say about that. Hello, Peter, and once again, welcome back to the Project Management Podcast. Cornelius, thank you. Yes, back again. You can't get rid of me, can you? Yes, unfortunately. Ah, well. (laughs) <laughs> well, thanks for being back. We want to take a look at a new ebook that you have just published. But before we do that, let's turn around and take a look back to the last book you published. That was The Lazy Blogger. How successful was it? Um, I, I'm quite pleased. It sold, um, it sold about 125 copies in total. Um, which raised a reasonable sum for um, the cancer research at that point in time mm-hmm. um, or over the Christmas period. So, it, uh, it, you know, I'm pleased. It was, it was successful. Hopefully a few people had some enjoyment from the stories that were inside that. And I thank you and uh, the, uh, the podcast for the support. Absolutely. We're happy to do that. You have just released a new ebook once again. Uh, you're donating the proceeds to a good cause. It's called The Lazy Blogger. Uh, excuse me, not The Lazy Blogger. The History of Lazy. You get me all the history of lazy. <laughs> it's called The History of Lazy. So what is I produced, The History of Lazy? Yeah, I produce too many books. So uh, I, I, I do a lot of writing. And in between the, the, the real books that are being published, uh, I produce a lot of material for articles, etc., the history of lazy it just struck me again is that you know there was there's an important cause out there with the uh, the the japanese situation and uh, you know i had all this material that came about mostly because several people um out there had asked me questions about the journey i've been on over the last 2 years to the point of you know where the lazy project manager is the brand that's out there and the popularity um and rather than individually write to people, I decided now was a good time to collate the history and put it all together. They, my experiences of writing the book, of getting speaking engagements, of starting my own podcasts, of blogging, of article writing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really the history of Lazy, uh, for the most part, is about that two-year journey and also my, ex- my experience and experiments into the social work media world, which has been very enlightening. Added to that, I've added uh, a whole, it's the, it is the history of Lazy and other stories. And I've added to that um, a number of other articles that I have put in place uh, over, the, over the period of time to actually um, share with people uh, a little bit more information about lazy, laziness, productive laziness and things like that. All right. And as you have just mentioned, the proceeds of the book, they will go to the Japanese Relief Fund. Did, did you come? Compile this ebook as a means to help Japan, or had you wanted to compile it anyway? Um, I think that would, you know, given time, because I just build up material and uh, I'm a very sharing sort of person, that I probably would have produced a book. I kind of, in my back of mind, thought, well, maybe, maybe next December, about this, you know, a year after the Lazy Blogger, perhaps I'd have enough material. But, uh, you know, with the situation that, that, you know, the terrible situation over in Japan, um, I thought, well, this model worked, you know, reasonably well last time and and raised an amount of money that actually I could accelerate this and and produce the the e-book now. And as a result of that, I could, um, you know, gain some uh, some money for the Japanese Red Cross and, uh, you know, try and help out in my own tiny way. 
All right. So how much does the history of lazy cost and how much of that goes to the relief effort? Right. The cost of it is £3.50. That's in uh, English money, of course. Um, although anybody can buy it through my uh, my website, uh, in, uh, easily, easily done. Um, uh, as much as possible will go. So the only deduction from that £3.50 will be the very small PayPal uh, fee that uh, I have to pay for actually selling the book through PayPal. Uh, apart from that, uh, 100% of, uh, of everything else goes to the, uh, the, the Japanese Red Cross. Okay. And in the email that you originally sent out about this, you mentioned that it's 17,500 words long. And this is very important. I am guaranteeing that it will have some typos and logical errors. Can you really guarantee that there are typos in it? Because I'm not going to buy it if, if you know, <laughs> later on I realize there are no typos in this. <laughs> um, I, I can guarantee. I, I, when, I, when I launched the Lazy Blogger, um, people were very kind. They came back to me in a very nice way and said, oh, did you realize you spelled something wrong here and this didn't make sense here? Uh, in, in, they did it in a very good spirit, the fact they understood it was for, it was for charity and I'd self-published and self-edited, which is one of the hardest things to possibly do. So I haven't, um, I, I haven't, uh, you know, I guess I had, I'm not a 100% guarantee, but I am. 99.99% certain that there will be a typo in there because um, I self-edited it, so therefore I'm sure I will miss something. Um, Excellent. Hopefully that will uh, satisfy your need to have that guaranteed, um, but not upset anybody by uh, coming across one or two errors because it's all in a good cause. Great. So I do encourage all our listeners right now to go out there, spend £3.50 and buy a few typos from Peter Taylor called The History of Lazy. And of course, the most important thing, Peter, where do people now have to go to in order to buy the book? OK, they go to my website, which is www.thelazyprojectmanager.com, thelazyprojectmanager.com. And just on there, you can select a tab, which is buy the book. And the top item in the online bookstore is now this, uh, this book, The History of Lazy. Excellent. Peter, thank you so much for once again donating the proceeds of this book to a good cause. And thanks for being back on the program. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. So, go ahead and stop by at the Lazy Project Manager and buy this book for a good cause. If, however, you would much rather win a book, to be precise, if you would like to win a copy of Rick Valergo's The Cure for the Common Project, well then you are in luck, because we are giving away two copies. One copy, as always, is reserved for our premium listeners. So, if you are a premium project management podcast listener, there's nothing you have to do. And the second copy, that one can be grabbed by anyone. To participate in this giveaway, please go to facebook.com slash pmpodcast and look for the book giveaway. Just leave a comment in the book giveaway and you have entered. And now, the interview. Rick Valerga is the author of The Cure for the Common Project, five core themes that transform project managers into leaders and a speaker on the subject of project leadership. His industry experience includes program and project management for Agilent Technologies in electronics hardware, software and aerospace defense applications, and assignment as an officer with the U.S. Navy's Civil Engineer Corps. Rick has been a project management professional since 2003. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Systems Engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy and a Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering from Stanford University. And now, please lead the way into our Project Leadership Series. Enjoy the interview. The Project Management Podcasts Feature Interview Today with Rick Valerga author of the book, The Cure for the Common Project. Hello, Rick, and welcome to the Project Management Podcast. Thank you, Cornelius. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. 
So your book is titled The Cure for the Common Project, and yet it is about project leadership. What was the inspiration for this particular title? Well, it ties in with the subtitle of the book, which is Five Core Themes That Transform Project Managers into Leaders. This book is about the everyday leadership behaviors that help us unleash the value of the tools for project management. <laughs> I thought of it all like a prescription, a daily dosage. And so I symbolized these five core themes with five pills on the cover and used the title, The Cure for the Common Project as the headline. Right. So instead of the cure for the common cold, we're talking about the cure for the common project. And those five themes we'll be hearing about, those are the five pills that you have to swallow <laughs> in order to cure your project misery. Is that it? That's right. That's right. Okay. So what is your personal interest in project leadership? Well, I have found that for something so important, project leadership is woefully underrepresented. There are thousands of books available on project management tools and methodologies, but far fewer related to project leadership. And that's unfortunate because poor project leadership behavior can completely undermine the tools of project management. On the other hand, great project leadership can help us get the most bang for our buck from the PM tools. All right. So now, I, of course, I have to ask you, how do you define leadership? I define leadership as the ability to influence others to deliver results. Now, I'd also like to point out that this book is about project leadership. Project leadership exists at the nexus of project management and general leadership. And we need not be all things to all people. For example, the project managers at Apple don't necessarily need to possess the uncanny visionary abilities of Steve Jobs in order to be successful. The leadership need is different. I'm talking about the everyday leadership behaviors that matter most when coupled with the accepted practices of project management. And the best thing is that these leadership themes are highly accessible because they come from within. Right. I, I can completely follow what you've just said because I've been a project manager slash leader all my life. And then at one point, they made me into a line manager. And frankly, I wasn't a good line manager. <laughs> so I was very happy when I was allowed to go back to project management because that's what I was good at. So you're saying we're talking here about leadership in a project environment and not leadership in a CEO CEO type style, right? Absolutely. We're not trying to boil the ocean here. Okay. So your book discusses those five core themes that you mentioned, those five pills of project leadership. But you begin the book by talking about integrity. Now, why do you do that? That's a great question. Integrity is the absolute foundation for project leadership. Integrity means never letting your project live a lie. So if your project plan is a house of cards or your schedule will be indisputably delayed or if you discover that your product will fall flat in the market, you need to have the courage to bring these issues to light. Integrity is not in addition to the five core themes. It's the root of the five core themes. In fact, I call the five core themes the mechanism for delivering your personal integrity within the project environment. And when you ingrain integrity into the everyday fabric of your projects, you are well positioned for success. All right. So let's stop beating around the bush here, or rather beating around those five core themes. Let's jump into them. So can you introduce us to the five core themes and explain uh, how it is, as you say, that they deliver integrity? Certainly. The first core theme is expectation management, 
when we're doing this, we're making responsible commitments, even under duress. That's integrity. The second core theme is ownership. This requires the strength to maintain visible accountability for our project's results, even in terrible circumstances. That's integrity. The third core theme is winning. This involves solving our project's toughest make or break problems. When we do this without destroying our team members or their families, that's integrity. The fourth core theme is narrative. When we deliver a frequent, up-to-date, consistent message that's agreed across our stakeholders, that's integrity. And the fifth core theme is eliciting the best. Here we attempt to tap into the highest potential of our stakeholders, not just the team members, but also customers, managers, and suppliers. When we do this in a sincere manner, that's integrity. Okay, so that's how integrity connects to these five core themes. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to delve deeper into each of these five core themes. So let's go through an overview for each of these five core themes, uh, why they are important, and maybe also what things we can do to implement them within ourselves, within our projects, to make them part of our arsenal as project leaders, or the arsenal of skills as a project leader. So let's begin with the first one was expectation management, right? Absolutely. In the end, our projects are judged by people, the customers, mm -hmm. the sponsor, the team members. Most of these people are not imbued with project management theory. They only judge whether the project lived up to its billing as interpreted by them. It's a subjective process. And above all, these people hate to be surprised. <laughs> so the, the best way to address this is by making expectation management a daily mantra. Okay, and how do we do that? Well, we need to emphasize the importance of realistic, responsible commitments with buy-in from all sides to capture and advertise the level of risk tolerance, to deliver tough news in a manner that respects the people impacted, to welcome outside help and opinions, to extend trust and empowerment to others, but track progress for all to see. All of this leads to increases in sponsor understanding and team accountability and our own professional credibility. That's a tall order. That really is a tall order. Because in many cases, the, the one thing that you mentioned there is, you know, team responsibility. Oftentimes, you know, the team is just thrown together and placed in front of you going here, that's your team, uh, you know, go forth and, and manage your project, you know, and now we're supposed to do all that with a team that, you know, is, is, is barely in the forming stage. So you, you're putting a, a, a lot of pressure here on us as project managers. <laughs> Right. Well, expectation management is a tall yeah. order. And I, I like to ask, hey, if it's so easy, why does it get screwed up so often? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if it were easy, why would they need us to lead a project? <laughs> because then everybody could do it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So let's move on. Expectation management, the first pill that we have to swallow and, and digest and, and get into our system. The next one we have is ownership. Well, I have observed that there is a continuum, a spectrum that all project managers exist upon. On one far end of the spectrum are 100% victims. And on the other far end are 100% owners. My book actually has a questionnaire that can help you calibrate where you might land on, the, on that spectrum. I have seen PMs take on the victim mentality, conjure up excuses in tough times, become martyrs, 
And that's normally a good predictor that the project is about to unravel. Leaders set the example, and we are far stronger as leaders when we take the stance of ownership. Mm -hmm. And how do we do this as leaders? How do we put ownership into practice on the project? Well, when we don't agree with change or don't agree with process, we shouldn't act like it's forced upon us. Rather, we should articulate impacts to our sponsor and deal with it constructively. And we need to fully commit to results. We can't allow ourselves the backdoor escape of excuses because our attitude of ownership directly influences our actions, which ultimately influences the project team. Hmm. So you're saying the old excuse, well, I'm not quite sure why I have to do this, but the PMO is making me do it, doesn't count anymore. It won't fly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Winning is the next pill on your list, or rather the next theme on your list. I recently read a New York Times article called What Makes a Hospital Great? It was about what differentiated the top 5% hospitals from the bottom 5%. One headline was that organizational culture was key. But what was it about the culture that made a difference? Well, at the bottom hospitals, when there was an error with the patient, the doctors and nurses and pharmacists had a pattern of blaming one another while the hospital leaders ran for cover. At the top hospitals, the difference was an eagerness to address the error without disparaging one another with a goal to improve processes. And to me, this article showcases the benefits of a culture that can turn difficult times into something constructive, that is, a winning culture. Okay, and how do you suggest that we implement a winning culture on our projects? And remember, very often the culture and the way we have to manage our projects is sort of, you know, pushed upon us from outside of the company now. So we have, we have to, to fight that as well. So how do we do it? Well, during tough times and surprises, we need to recognize that fear is a common factor. But fear forces people into def defensive postures and irrational states of mind, which is not where we want them when we're asking them to analyze issues logically. We need to foster an environment that removes this fear rather than fanning its flames. We can also try to set up our project plans for early wins with an emphasis on generating team momentum. The core theme of winning really allows us tenacity with sustainability. Okay, I get it. I get it. So you're saying... Winning is an attitude. It's okay to fail on this project, but we will work together to fix a problem, to move forward, and in that way, we grow together as a team and we move towards a success in the project. Is, is, is that it? Do I translate this correctly? Absolutely. As long as you sense that people are doing their best, I completely agree. All right. Moving on, the fourth out of your five core themes is narrative. Narrative is really about the leadership behaviors required to make communication effective. Let's face it, there is a vast sea of communication tools out there growing by the day. So much, in fact, that it can be overwhelming. The project leader needs to have the right philosophy the right attitude about communication. It's an attitude that says it is not acceptable for multiple competing storylines to be circulating among my stakeholders. It's an attitude that says 
if you bring a concern about the project to me, you deserve to know what I'm doing about it. We need to ingrain this kind of attitude into everyday project communication. Okay. Everybody on a project usually has different types of communication skills. They tell things differently. They view things differently. So what then do we need to do as project leaders to ensure that, you know, there is a narrative that is consistent throughout the project? My book suggests an example that can serve as both a meeting agenda, and also a regular communication to internal stakeholders. It starts with a big picture, critical path, milestone view. Then it provides a dashboard of the major activities over the next two months, and then transitions to the fine print via the risk register. The objective here is to develop a consistent mechanism that drives alignment, ensures transparency, and manages risk, which helps make communication a critical asset for our project teams. All right. So we've had four core themes so far. We've had expectation management, ownership, Winning, we just heard narrative, and now we're moving over to the last one. I'm looking really forward to hearing about this one. Eliciting the best. What is it? How do we do it? Let's face it. Projects are at their best when people are at their best. And I'm not just talking about taking care of the troops and then getting out of the way, which many project managers do well. Projects are at their best when all the people are at their best, including the sponsor, customers, suppliers, adjacent functional organizations. That's why I talk about eliciting the best from 360 degrees. All right. How do you do it? Well, one way to start is by simply listening. We have a vast amount of knowledge available to us through our stakeholders. We need to make sure that we are regularly tapping into all of it. Or we can take on the practice of commending in public, but criticizing in private. And finally, we need to tap into intrinsic motivation. The key here is to practice this core theme regularly and across all of our stakeholders. Okay. So those were your five core themes. Now... Let me ask you a simple question. So what you're saying here is, um, well, if you're able to master these five themes, then you're a project leader. Is that it? Is it that simple? Yes, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) When you regularly practice these core themes in conjunction with the tools of project management, you influence realistic commitments with buy-in from all sides. You influence perseverance through tough times. You influence a consistent story across the stakeholders, and you influence people making their best contributions. My definition of leadership was to influence others to deliver results. With these five core themes in place, you have clearly done that. Okay. Which of these five core themes do you think that most project managers lack today? Without mentioning any names, please. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when I give presentations on this material, I do a 10-minute exercise and ask people to get together to talk about the biggest challenge that they presently face as a leader and which core theme they could use the most. And I actually encourage the listeners in this podcast to do the same. Now, afterwards, I poll the crowd, and expectation management is usually the most frequently identified theme. And it's for good reason. It's always so difficult to do so consistently over the entire course of a project. I also find that victimhood is a big issue for project managers. This tends to surface a bit more when people take a deeper dive into the material, such as at our seminar. Okay. 
So if these are kind of the issues then, but still, you know, as a project leader, you need all five, you said. But what are some of the ways that you recommend how project managers can learn the skills needed to implement these five core themes, to live these five core themes on their projects? Well, my website outlines three ways to do this. First, there is a free project leadership assessment. 50 questions to help you identify your strengths and weaknesses within the context of the five core themes. Then there's my book. And we also offer a highly interactive two-day seminar that takes a much deeper dive into the five core themes and includes a comprehensive project simulation on the second day. But it's important to note that no matter which of these paths you choose, you need to focus on and practice the five core themes every day. Mm -hmm. When you mentioned website, I clicked here. And on the website, I can read that in this book, we should be able to learn, and I quote, the forces you can use to drive alignment between your customers, team members, and sponsors. Um, What are some of these forces? Well, this gets back to the integrity section at the beginning of the book. There is a Venn diagram showing how the interests of the three major constituencies, that is the sponsor, the customers, and the team members, how these three constituencies are optimally aligned through the application of integrity. You'll recall that integrity is delivered to the project Mm -hmm. through the five core themes. So these five core themes are the forces. For example, (laughs) so some examples, expectation management calls for realistic, responsible plans that balance profitability, competitiveness, and team sustainability. That's alignment. Narrative calls for us to implement the right communication tools to help ensure transparency and drive alignment. Eliciting the best calls for us to remember that projects are at their best when all the stakeholders are at their best. That's alignment. Okay, so here's my final question for you then. Can you describe to me sort of the ideal project leader? You know, somebody who knows these five core themes and how he or she brings these five core themes together in order to lead a project and not just simply manage a project? Certainly. The ideal project leader need not be the visionary, but she will not rest until the project's vision is crystal clear. She need not be a master orator, but her stakeholders will continually know what is going on. She need not be the expert, but the experts will admire the organization and structure she brings. She will have a command of the tools and methodologies of project management, and she will unleash the value of these tools through the five core themes of project leadership. Excellent, thank you very much, Rick. Once again, the book is called The Cure for the Common Project, Five Core Themes that Transform Project Managers into Leaders, written by Rick Valerga. It's 184 pages thick, and it is published by Book Surge. Thanks for being on the program, Rick. Thank you as well, Cornelius. It's been a real pleasure. And that was Rick Valerga in our Project Leadership series. Don't forget, if you would like to win a copy of Rick Valerga's book, The Cure for the Common Project, then please go to facebook.com slash pmpodcast, look for the book giveaway and simply leave a comment. That's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. As always, you can find us on the web at pm-podcast.com. If you are a project manager who wants to become a BMP, then the easiest way to do so is with our sister podcast, the Project Management Prepcast, and study for the exam by watching over 38 hours of video training from pmprepcast.com. Please send your emails to info at pm-podcast.com. And when you write, please tell me where in the world you are writing from. And finally, 
we have this. Adopted from Confucius. People make a project work. A project alone seldom makes people work. Until next time. Rick, there's one more thing I wanted to know from you. What was your most embarrassing project management moment? Well, I'll have to go back to my days as a naval officer for that one. I was on an Air Force base, and my job was to oversee the procurement of a $20 million office complex. Now, the project was near completion, and we were just a few weeks away from the ribbon-cutting ceremony. The base commander was a one-star general, and a three-star general had flown in for the weekend. So the base commander wants to show off his brand new office complex. So he takes the three-star general over to one of his new buildings. They head toward one of the buildings, but there's a construction worker sweeping up around the front door. All he has to do is pick up his broom and stand aside. But reportedly, he looks up at these two uniformed generals and says, Go around to the back. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> of course the and of course the base leadership got a big kick out of this and I never heard the end of it. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>